the bird, Charlie Parker. Charlie? Charlie, welcome back. It's nice having you with us. Hello, it's good to be back. <laughs> There's one thing that he wanted to do. He didn't worry about anything else as long as he could play that horn. He loved that horn. There's no question about it. He probably loved some other things that he did as well. You know what I mean? But he wanted to play that horn. He had a very magnetic personality. He was irresistible. And uh, he had a presence. When he walked in a room, it wasn't like an ordinary man walking into a room. I've never known a man in my whole life. I didn't know a man then, and I don't know, I haven't met a man since that, that uh, attracted people to him the way Bird did. When I first heard Charlie Parker, it was similar to a laser. He impressed me more than anybody to that point. Charlie Parker had a, a new approach to playing music. We had the music, but we didn't have the, so I say, pyrotechnics. in April, that my family, six children, and my mother moved into the Parker's house. That's when I first met Charlie. We lived upstairs, and he was standing by the banister with knickers on. I remember the knickers, and looking at uh, all of us go up the steps. And his mother was there, and that's when we connected, Charlie and I. The home Rebecca Ruffin and her family moved into was a big old-fashioned frame house on Olive Street in a black section of Kansas City. The 14-year-old boy who eyed her from the banister that day was destined to become one of the most influential figures in 20th century music. Charles Parker Jr. was born August 29, 1920, in Kansas City, Kansas. His father, a Pullman chef and ex-vaudeville hoofer, left home when Charlie was a boy, taking with him Charlie's half-brother, John. Shortly afterwards, his mother, Addie, moved the boy across the river to Kansas City, Missouri. An imposing, devoted, hard-working woman, part Negro and part Choctaw Indian, Addie took in the Ruffins as boarders. The two families lived as one until Mrs. Ruffin saw how much attention Charlie was paying her daughter. Well, we had been going together, and um, uh, somehow Mama, after I graduated from high school, my mother saw that we were getting very close, so we moved in the year 36. I think it was March. But uh, later on, uh, my oldest sister, she helped me to get out to see Charlie, and he was playing with uh, Lawrence Keys at the Passale Hall dance bands. So we, she helped me to get out to see him. And the night of Jolos' fight, his first fight, 
he, we were sitting on the attic school steps, and I was about to go in. He asked me, he says, uh, you know, Rebecca, if Miss Ruffin knew we were seeing each other, she would kill you. Let's get married. I said, okay. <laughs> we went down to the courthouse and uh, doing the ceremony. Charlie didn't have any rings or nothing. So Miss Parker took her rings off. She gave it to him and placed them on my finger. That was it. When Charlie asked his mother to buy him an alto sax at 12, there was little reason to think anything would come of it. The music conservatories in Kansas City did not admit blacks, and his mother could not have afforded the tuition if they had. But nothing could dispel Charlie's obsession with the alto saxophone or with the improvisations and headlong rhythms of jazz. Kansas City was open, and it was, and it was jumping, you know. Well, Joe Turner was... Wailing, you could walk out of there and go in there and shoot you some crabs if you wanted to, you know, next door, or the next room, or whatever, you know what I mean. Or uh, whatever you, in the town was moving, you know. You see, all the cats is there, and all the babes are there, and all the gamblers and pimps. Well, you see, you know what that means, what that means, you know. That means musicians are coming there, too, see. So you got a whole mixture going on. You got a lot of stuff going on all the time, and it, it never did stop 24 hours a day. Charlie played in the high school band and at dance halls. He practiced constantly. When he went to the movies, he tried to figure out how the scores were written. He memorized the solos on records and haunted the downtown club standing in doorways to hear the masters. Louis Armstrong, the genius who first demonstrated how expressive and vital a music jazz could be, was in the era before Charlie Parker the most influential of its virtuoso stylists. Uh, is anyone finer in the state of Carolina? If there is, then you know, show to me, Dinah. The dick not blazing, from another city gazing to the eyes of Dinah Lee. Baby, every man one eye, shake my fight, oh, cut my dynamite, change the mind, Bobby didn't did you know. Well, he always said that Louis was the master, you know. You know, Louis could, Louis could take anything and do something with it. And that's what he always loved about Louie. Charlie absorbed the lessons of many musicians. One of his favorite records was Fletcher Henderson's Stealing Apples, featuring the tenor saxophonist Leon Chu Berry. Charlie was so impressed with Berry's rolling authoritative sound that he named his son after him. Charlie was only 18 when Leon was born, but he seemed much older. He had committed his life to music, and at a time when the alto sax was dominated by Benny Carter and Johnny Hodges, he was fortunate to find a hometown master of the instrument who took him under his wing, Buster Smith. Bird worked with Buster, you know. He worked with Buster's group, and really that was Bird's man, you know. Bird. I remember I heard a broadcast one night during the time that he was Bird was working with Prof, and uh, so I told uh, Prof, I said, Prof, I said, you sure did sound good last night. He says, What do you mean sound good last night? He says, I didn't play last night. He says she didn't come up on that bread, and, and I quit. He said that was Charlie Parker you heard last night. I said, what? And it, it sounded just like, you know what I mean, to me, it uh, sounded so much like the prof, you know, we call Buster Smith prof. There were quite a number of other alto players that Bird admired. I mean, people you wouldn't expect, like Jimmy Dorsey, and of course Johnny Hodges, which you did expect. He always talked about Jimmy Dorsey, 
And he uh, 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 always makes about certain things that Jimmy Dorsey played, you know. And he, he, uh, I, uh, he would do this when he would do. Um, it's about the time he might be swinging like crazy and he'd go into Jimmy Dorsey's theme song. And it's, it's still swung. Still, Charlie seemed less responsive to the other altoists than to the major innovators of tenor sax, all of whom appeared in the Kansas City area. It was Ben Webster who later offered him a job in New York. The already legendary Coleman Hawkins. and especially the star of the Count Basie Orchestra, Lester Young. Oh, he loved Lester. No question, he had a great impact on the bird because we would uh, set our brakes when we find out the bass is going to broadcast. We would set our brakes along with the broadcast. Then we'd run out in the car and listen to the broadcast, and he definitely wanted to hear Lester, you know. That was his main purpose, very. When you start speaking to Basie, you see, that's, that's just putting Bird right on at home, you know, because, see, you know, Bird loves that bassy sound, you know. And then Bird loved swing, see. He loved to swing because he loved, loved to pat his foot. He loved to see people patting their foot. He loved to see people moving. Charlie took frequent jobs in the Ozarks, 150 miles away. On Thanksgiving of 1936, the band's speeding car skidded on ice and overturned. One man was killed. Charlie broke three ribs and fractured his spine. After he recovered, Rebecca noticed changes. About July of 37, he called me upstairs. And he says, go sit around that side of the bed. I thought he had something for me. I looked in the mirror and I saw him stick this needle in his arm and I screamed and I got up and I said why and he just smiled and he took the, uh, took the uh, his tie was the tourniquet and I was watching then it came into my mind that on, his, on the dresser I'd seen so many other ties in small ties but that was all. He didn't say anything. He just wiped his arm and put the tie around him, under his collar, put his jacket on, and come over and kiss me on the forehead. And he says, see you in the morning. Jay McShann arrived in Kansas City broke, but determined to organize a band of his own. By 1939, he had recruited the city's best young musicians for an outstanding orchestra with a penchant for the blues. Charlie was a major asset as a dazzling soloist and an able section man. While traveling with McShann, Charlie was to acquire a permanent nickname. Well, we used to go up there and play a 
when I was to fraternities, you know, sororities in Lincoln. And this particular day, we were going up and we were driving up. We had automobiles, you know, I think we had about three or four cars. And, um, and the car that Bird was riding in, and, you know, I'd be driving along the highway, just two lanes, one going and one coming, you know. And uh, when you pass through these little settlements, the farmers' chickens would run all out on the highway, right outside of the car, you know. And so uh, <laughs> they hit one of the chickens, you know. And so they said, hey, man, did you know you hit that yard bird back there? So the driver says, well, what about it? He said, man, stop this car and back up. Let's pick up to the yard bird. So they did. They stopped. Well, the guy backed up and picked up the yard bird. Bird took it on into Lincoln. And uh, during those times, you know, we stayed at uh, at people's houses, you know. And at the lady's house where he stayed, he took it in and asked her. He said, Miss, we hit this yard bird coming up here. Would you cook this yard bird for me? She says, sure. And so Bird had him a feast. (laughs) Musicians now called him Yard Bird, or Yard, or Bird. And the name seemed to act as an impetus. Living on the road, he had little time for his family, and Kansas City was no longer a hotbed for music. He yearned to flee the Midwest and make his name in New York. His departure was inevitable. He came to me. Uh, he says, I'd like to have a talk with you, Rebecca. So we went into the dining room, and we both sit there, and he held my hand, and he says, uh, Rebecca, would you free me, please? And I just looked at him. He says, I believe I could become a great musician if I were free. I never said a word. It's just something, you know. So he called his mother. He says, Ma, would you come in here, please? And she said, what is it, Charlie? And he says, Rebecca, Rebecca is going to free me. And I want you to make a promise to me that for as long as she and beyond live, they have a roof over their head, food in their mouth. And that's all. Or he would never be back. Charlie pawned his horn, stole a ride on a freight train bound for Chicago, and made his way to New York. He loved New York, yes, you know, no question about it. He always talked about, even when we had the small band, that he wanted to get back to New York. In fact about it, during the time when we had the small band, he left the band for about a year and was gone and went, came to New York. And because he, when he came back to Kansas City, he was telling about how he stood on the corner and he looked up there at the sign at the, the set Savoy Ballroom and looked and looked and so he just stood there and dreamed. There was little work for an unknown musician, but Charlie washed dishes for three months at $9 a week just to hear the awesome pianist at Jimmy's Chicken Shack, Art Tatum. In 1941, Charlie finally played the Savoy Ballroom with Jay McShann's band. They were a hit. Despite his personal unpredictability, Charlie's music had begun to display a fierce originality. His solos on Cherokee amazed musicians. Some of them, including Dizzy Gillespie, had formed a clique in the Earl Hines band, and they encouraged Hines to hire Bird. So Earl Hines told me, he said, now look, Mac, just now if you're Bird owe you any money, you better let me know. He said, because I got the money to pay if he owes you. He says, because now he says, now I want him, I'm going to get him anyway. He said, I'm going to get him. He said, because I got the money to get him. I said, well, listen. I said, well, okay, this guy says, listen, he owed me so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so uh, Earl signed the Earl paid me off. He says, can he go now? I said, yes. So Bird went on with Hines' band. So he was 
Bert Hines, man. So I didn't see the cats. Hines or Bert and them, none of them for about three and a half or four months. So when I saw him again, I think we were down at uh, Kelly Stables on 52nd Street. And Earl Hines come up to me. He says, listen, he says, come back. He says, look, man, come, go get, come get this Charlie Parker. He says, because that is the worst guy in the world. I said, but you told me you were going to make a man out of him. <laughs> he said, no, look. He said, he owes everybody in town, owes everybody in the band. He says, and I don't know where the horn is. <laughs> One of the first times that I really was impressed by the Earl Hines Orchestra was on a Friday night at the Apollo Theater. It was his opening night there, and Sarah Vaughan, who had just joined him, it was her first real professional night as a musician, came out and sang Body and Soul. I wrote about it in a metronome and said that she showed a remarkable harmonic sense or something. And that was just when the beboppers were beginning to infiltrate the band. New York is the place, and both of us blossomed after you know, our meeting. And then it was signified by the idea that I went with Earl Hines at the same time he did. His because he was playing tenor at the time, but uh, his music was still, was still the same. So we got together there and we played with Billy Eckstein. I love the rhythm in the rhythm. When the music comes, I get left. Body, little, 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 Blend with the mellow saxophone. Little, 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 what a lot of cake to drink. When that rhythm's in ya, the blues don't have a chance. Find that groove in ya, make you never think about romance. Jump, jump your rhythm with the rip. Any kind of music, it's a lift. Body, little, 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 anything to make it drink. Bill X. Simon was one of the best band leaders. Probably the best that I had to work for. Uh, he, uh, he understood the music. He was a supporter of the music. Mm. Uh, supporter of your inventing. He was just a beautiful man. Charlie Parker's apprenticeship with Hines and Eckstein was not recorded because of a strike that halted the production of records for two years. Yet it was during that time that the seeds of modern jazz or bebop blossomed. The after-hour jam sessions at a Harlem club called Mittens encouraged an appetite for new harmonies, melodies, and rhythms. The house band included two major contributors to modern jazz. The pianist and composer Thelonious Monk was celebrated for his total originality and subtle humor. drummer Kenny Clark created surprising rhythmic accents that were often cited as the origin of the rhythmic word bebop. By 1945, a generation of modernists was in place, including three of Parker's most steadfast collaborators, Drummer Max Roach, famed for his glittering touch in melodic solos. Pianist Bud Powell, a virtuoso who constantly plumbed the deepest wellsprings of emotion. And trumpeter Miles Davis, the most lyrical of the modernist and subsequently a major innovator in his own right. 
The nucleus for jazz in New York was not Harlem, but 52nd Street, where a block-long bazaar of nightclubs offered an extravagant banquet of talent. There was much resistance to the new jazz, but when Parker and Gillespie opened at the Three Deuces in 1945, the fast kinetic ensemble themes and flaring solos seemed to speak out for a generation that had just lived through the most barbaric war in history. and then the white rose here and then there's another couple of clubs up here on the second street. So between sets, we... It's a big, big, big deal. Everybody's going to different places, you know. To hear the other guys that were on the street at the time. It was a strange mixture because uh, one side of the street you had Jimmy Ryan's where all the Dixielanders went and on the other side you would have maybe Jack Teagard in one place, Art Tatum in another, Billy Holiday. Colin Hawkins, all these incredible people. And uh, that was also the White Rose Bar, which was on the corner of 52nd and 6th Avenue, where you would go between sets to meet with the other musicians. And uh, I remember one night, uh, Ben Webster was telling me about this fantastic alder play. I think it was really the first time I was introduced to Charlie Parker. I heard about Bird before I heard him. Um, there was a band, I believe it was at the Onyx, with Don Bias and Dizzy. And uh, Don was leaving the band, and I thought Don was just the end. I loved Don's music. And I knew the press agent at the club and uh, asked who they were, could possibly get to replace Don Bias. And they said, oh, there's a cat in Kansas City. You don't know him. His name's Charlie Parker. And I said, is he cute? And my friend said, no, but you'll dig him. <laughs> but Bird never made that gig. And uh, then when he did come, he, he opened at the Deuces with Dizzy. That was the first time I heard him. His sound was so different because I was used to Johnny Hodges and Benny Carter. And his sound took me a, a minute to get used to, but I knew what he was playing was something just incredible. The street at, during that era, it was during World War II, and there were a lot of servicemen on the street, a lot of servicemen from the South who had never seen a, a racially mixed couple. There were a lot of problems with that. One of the things that was happening back in that period, the initial period of the bebop, they would take a composition and make a different melody of it, like say, like, what is this thing called love? And they would make a different melody, a different line that they would use. They wouldn't play the melody like, what is this thing called love? They would play a sort of a, sort of a bebop line to it, as we would call it, a line a melody, the out chorus, and on the same chords, and maybe change a few of the chords in the structure of the tone. Bird first recorded as a leader in November of 1945 with Dizzy, Max Roach, and Miles Davis. The masterpiece of the session was based on Charlie's specialty number, Cherokee. Tenor saxophonist and band leader Charlie Barnett had made the tune a popular hit despite its difficult chords. Parker's version ignored the song's melody entirely. The result was a culminating performance that encompassed everything Parker had learned. It was an inspired, thrilling assault on musical conventions, and he called his line, Coco. Thank <laughs> you. 
Two weeks after the Cocoa session, Bird and Dizzy made a fateful visit to Los Angeles. For Charlie, the trip lasted two years and proved almost fatal. Well, we had an eight-week job out right then, and it was very new music. California was a long ways off, and they, they were behind, and evolution. Only the guys from New York that were out there they knew what was happening, you know, with the new, with the new music. Bird had his triumphs in L.A., Yardbird Suite, A Night in Tunisia, Ornithology, and more. But he was coming apart at the seams, drinking heavily and overindulging his addiction. During that time, heroin was the, was the thing. And if Bird got high, all musicians and fans figured that was the thing to do. That's how much people lied and lied. I mean, they would do it just because Charlie Parker did it. When Charlie Parker used drugs, it, it seemed to be uh, almost socially acceptable as far as uh, the people in and around music. I thought the, the, the heroin and, and, and the bebop and the, the whole lifestyle, they went together. I felt that... Uh, one had to use heroin to play, like Charlie Parker played. The Love Man session, I call it the most catastrophic recording session in history. Bird came in late, everybody was all, everybody was really late, but Bird hadn't made his connection. And he was trying to make a session uh, without his medicine, i put it like that. Now, I can't put him in chronological order how he went down, but, but we did, uh, was it, we did Bebop, Max making wax, and he scuffled through those. In fact, he scuffled through all of them. Lover Man and the Gypsy. But by the time we got to the Gypsy, he was so... So out of, he was, the man was ill. He just couldn't go any farther. Now, I've been on the stand with him before where he had to leave the stand to be so low. You understand what I'm saying? Like at the Heidi Hole Club, a different club. This was a recording session. And uh, Howard had to finish the session. So they had to take him out of there, take him home, you know. And that's the reason I call it catas the most ca catastrophic session. Because what he played on those tunes, the bird was real ill. But if you listen to Lover Man, nothing but soul. I don't think anybody was particularly aware of exactly when he came home. There was certainly no welcome home celebration. He just uh, reappeared on the scene and was very clean for quite a while. And actually, I saw a side of Charlie Parker, fortunately, more often than not, when uh, he was straight. And when he was straight, he was very good, very normal, happy company. I mean, we went out to the beach together with my wife and my mother-in-law and my little daughter, and he would go out there and we'd eat hot dogs and walk along the beach and it was just like, you know, your next door neighbor. There was that side to Charlie which not everybody saw. He had a great uh, sense of caring. 
I, I was with Earl Hines, with Chief Yard, and I both were with him. And in and intermission, I was sitting up playing the piano. Right? The, 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 this is a good example. And then some white guy threw a couple of pennies up on the stage. I looked down at the pennies and just my wings kept playing. Well, that night after the dance, when I thought everybody had left, so it was a white dance, I went to the toilet. And when I came out of the toilet, I just happened to look around like this, and this guy had a bottle, and he hit me up here. This bottle and the blood came all out of my uniform. And I picked up a, I don't know, it was one of those big bed bottles. I was going to crown this guy. And a lot of guys grabbed me. And uh, Charlie Parker came in and saw this brother. He told the guy, he said, you took advantage of my friend, you cur. He called him a cur. <laughs> First time I'd heard that. <laughs> One day my doorbell on 52nd Street rang. I was living with Kim and my mother. And uh, this woman downstairs said, there's a man here on a horse to see you. Well, I knew it could only be Bird. So I went down and there was Bird on a Palomino and he'd come to show the horse to Kim. But the reason he did that was because he had great respect for my father whom he'd never met. He had a club at one time and he'd have the orchestra come to Westchester after work to play under my window, Why Do I Love You? And Bird was just emulating my father. He didn't, he didn't have a band to bring and so he brought the horse. He wanted to do something that Kim would remember the way I remembered my father bringing the band. The late 40s were the glory years of bebop as modern jazz was popularly known. The key innovators began to align the new music to their separate musical interest. Dizzy Gillespie suggested things to come when he formed a big band. Charlie Parker's preferred instrumentation remained, for the time being, his quintet, alto sax, trumpet, piano, bass, and drums. Although Parker received little attention from the general public, his fame among musicians was worldwide. His style was endlessly analyzed and imitated. You couldn't play in the modern jazz idiom without acknowledging a debt to Bird. In 1949, he made his first of two successful European tours. In Paris especially, he realized that he could achieve the kind of respect that was reserved for classical musicians at home. By then, his reputation was such that fans and musicians followed him with recording devices to preserve every solo, every glimmer of a musical idea. He felt uh, very, very proud and very honored, and he was treated so differently over there. He came back with gifts and records that people had given him, and he wanted to move there. He really, uh, I think that was his greatest triumph, the two European tours. 
The trip abroad also strengthened his resolve to expand the context of his music. With the help of producer Norman Granz, he organized an ensemble of strings for touring and recording. The strings reflected his long-standing passion for modern classical music. He hoped to study composition with Edgar Barrace, but there wouldn't be time for that. Instead, he recorded pop songs, including the masterful Just Friends. Bird told me that when he was traveling with the string section, uh, um, that he was on his best behavior. He showed up on time, um, he dressed well, he, uh, he kept his uh, drug use to a minimum. Uh, he practiced hard every day. He said he felt like he was being presented, he was being showcased properly. It was a very big, deep hurt to Bird when uh, when they took the strings, that's the way he said it, when they took the strings away from me. Parker was caught in a tailspin. He was trying to cut down on drugs and making it up with wine. He was erratic, often late, and sometimes absent from jobs. One night after an argument, he was banned from Birdland, the famous jazz club named in his honor. Yet Bird could still play with great brilliance. On a Sunday evening in 1952, Bird and Dizzy performed on the television show Stage Entrance, a show business omnibus with newspaper columnist Earl Wilson. Well, you know, Bird always felt that, um, that prejudice coming through that Earl definitely shows on the, uh, the tape. Uh, somehow he got through it with gritted teeth, but I love the expressions on the video where, uh, I mean, that's a definite put down. Bird could kill with a look, you know. And here he is, Mr. Leonard Bennett. Come on, Leonard, my boy. Yeah. Leonard Bennett. Here. Well, what, uh, this is quite an occasion, isn't it? Listen, uh, what do I do about this? Do I uh, say, give me five or uh, give me some oh. scanners? That stuff out of date. Well, that changes so fast, I'll have to look at my neck this is zombie to find out about it. Well, anyway, you got the awards, and it's, it's right. really quite an event. Well, it's quite an event, in two senses, actually, oh, because, you know, in the music business, we've been practicing brotherhood for quite a long time. Yeah. Man's color and his religion don't make any difference. When you put a horn in his hands, the only thing that counts is his talent. Well, I think that's a, the, the thing about the Down Beach All-American Band. It makes it All-American because it's a different creeds and different mm -hmm. uh, races. I believe that's right. Well, how about it? Who, uh, what, how are we going to get rid of these now? Here? Well, uh, I've been used to doing this for quite a while. Maybe it'd be a nice change if I turn it over to you let you mm -hmm. do the honors. Well, I'd love to. I'd love okay, to. Well, Charlie, to... Dizzy. <coughs> well, oh, here they are. Hello, this girl. is Charlie Parker. Thank and you. The famous Dizzy Gillespie. Now, fellas, uh, Leonard says I'm supposed to be the Toastmaster, the sort of the Georgie Jessel of Jazz. So, Charlie, I want to award you now uh, the downbeat award for the best alto sax man of 1951. Thank Congratulations you, to you. Thank you. And, uh, Diz, this is to you from Downbeat for being one of the top trumpet men of all time. Thank you. Congratulations, Diz. I mean, Dizzy, I got a little informal there. <laughs> You boys got anything more to say? Well, Earl, they say music speaks louder than words, so we'd rather voice our opinion that way, if you don't uh, mind. I think that'd be all right with everybody if you really want to do it. Good. Okay, now, while you fellows are getting us up there, I better tell the public that uh, we're going to have some really torrid tempo with Charlie Parker, the alto sax, and uh, Diz at the uh, trumpet, and Dick Hyman's at the piano. They're going to play, what is it? I think it's Hot House. Hot House? Okay, fellas, let's go.
another aspect of the bebop thing that was so hurtful and so upsetting to the musicians was that people treated it as a joke. You know, these write-ups in Time magazine and Life and so forth, all they concentrated on was Dizzy's beret and the horn rim glasses and the goatees and everything but the music itself. There was no serious attention paid to Charlie Parker as a great creative musician in the general national press, in the newspapers, in the magazines, on radio, on television, any of the media. It was just horrifying how, he, how really miserably he was treated. And this goes for the way Dizzy Gillespie is treated and everybody. I dig it, you ain't hip, old man, to easy pop pop in its own pan. You mean easy pop pop in its own pan? Now you're swinging, daddy, crazy man. Why don't you make it with me to the grocery shop? We'll both take a pan of this easy pop. The pop pop do the apple do the 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 pop do the art. Easy pop, man, that's real popcorn. Here's anthropology. Bird, he was a very different type of a person. I always enjoyed playing with him and being around him. Some nights he would come in and the club would be crowded. He'd just come in and play his heart out and burn. You could see something happen and play about it on his instrument. Like he'd see a pretty girl walk in the club we're playing. He'd be playing a solo, and all of a sudden he'd go into, a pretty girl is like a melody, wherever he was, and make it fit in. Or somebody was acting a little uh, looky tuna, he'd play some, something to fit that, you know, fast. Fast mind, genius mind, and it would fit. Yeah, I know sometimes he'd be playing a solo, and he'd be playing a certain part of uh, the last time I saw Paris, and he'd keep playing in different keys. Da 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 da. You know, and he's burning. Then at the end, I said, "Bird, what did happen the last time you saw Paris?" Charlie had two children with Chan, in addition to her daughter Kim, a boy Baird, and a girl Pri. In March 1954, while working in California, he learned that Pre, not yet three years old, died of a congestive heart condition. He broke. Eventually, Charlie separated from Chan and stayed with friends in Greenwich Village. But first, he made peace with a part of his past. The last time I saw him was 54, when he brought Chan to the house. Early one morning, he ushered me into the kitchen. I hadn't looked at him then. And we were looking out the uh, kitchen window. And he had his hand over mine like that. He says, if I had my life to live over, this is what I would want. He says, please forgive me. And that's when I looked up at him. And I says, oh my God, he's dying. Parker was reduced to playing in dives that were little more than empty storefronts. Drinking cheap red wine, he exacerbated his stomach ulcers. That was a suicide attempt. On March 9, 1955, a year after the death of his daughter, Charlie visited his friend, the Baroness Pananika de Koningswater, an ardent jazz enthusiast who lived at the Stanhope Hotel. Three days later, he died in her living room while watching the Tommy Dorsey show on television. The medical examiner estimated his age at 55 to 60 and attributed death to lobar pneumonia. Charlie Parker was 34 years old. When I first heard that Charlie Parker had died, I was, uh, I was on the bandstand at the California Club on a Monday night in Los Angeles. 
We took advantage of the fact that Bird had died uh, to announce to the people that we were going to take an extra, extra long intermission. Uh, we proceeded to go celebrate Bird's death uh, by doing the very thing that killed him. This is how, this is the way we celebrated uh, uh, Bird's passing was to go out and use some junk. You know, all of us. Uh, I think it would have been better uh, if we had uh, realized that that was a, it was time to stop. Well, I didn't have a marriage certificate. And um, he had been taken to the funeral home where our daughter, who had died a year before, had been. And we also had a two grave plot in the cemetery where she was buried. And I knew that Bird didn't want to go to Kansas City and that he would have wanted to have been buried next to our daughter. And uh, not having a marriage certificate, I didn't have any control. And he was taken out of the funeral home. He was taken to Harlem. His suit was changed. He was put in a pinstripe suit. A crucifix was hung over his coffin. Bird was irreligious. And uh, he was taken to Kansas City. And he was buried from uh, Adam Clayton Powell's church and by the Reverend Licorice, who <laughs> the music was uh, the Lost Chord, and uh, all the people who had uh, taken advantage of him financially and business-wise during his life were the pallbearers, and uh, it, was, it was really a travesty to use one of Bird's favorite words. They were going to bury him out here, up here in New York someplace. So I, I was thinking, I said, well, man, I, I, don't, I don't think that's right, you know, because his mother has been down there all this time, you know, and it looked like she should have the pleasure of going out to the gravesite and putting flowers on the grave and everything you know, like that. We had a close, a, a spiritual relationship. He could walk up and kiss me in my mouth. You know, what I was saying, you know, he, we love one another, you know. Charlie Parker's greatest triumph was what he did for jazz. What he did for jazz, what he did for music. He changed the whole complete scene. As we said a while ago, he was definitely a stylist. Everybody went that way. Piano players, trombone players, trumpet players, saxophone players. Mm -hmm. The triumph of Charlie Parker means to me that Bird lives. Believe me, he lives. His music lives. The triumph of Charlie Parker, uh, Charlie Parker is valid. It's, uh, it's here. Charlie Parker once said, music is your own experience, your thoughts, your wisdom. If you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. something of mine that Norman Grant decided he wanted to call Lee Frog. And the other another. side you call Relaxing with Lee. Who's Lee? I don't have the slightest idea. They named those tunes after I leave the studio. <laughs> they name it that could be Lee Conant, it could be Lee uh, somebody, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I only did this, really, Bird, because you... Uh, you have such a wonderful speaking voice, and not everybody gets a chance to, to hear you. And I thought that 
you know, just getting you to talk a little bit would make everybody feel fine. Um, your original, where is your home, by the way? Kansas City. I was going to say that. Uh, we reach that far. You do? Uh-huh. There's a chance friends of mine in my hometown are listening. I wonder if there's a friend in Kansas City this morning who is listening to uh, Charlie Parker and Strings. I wonder what they call Bob Garrity in the snake pit over there, Jetson 65454. Who, uh, who do you think might be listening this morning? I don't know. I have a lot of friends in Kansas City. You have Anybody a lot of... Could be listening? You do have a lot of friends in Kansas City. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, just for kicks, we uh, have stopped taking requests, you know. But just for kicks, it would be real wonderful if somebody from Kansas City... Hey, Garrity, you may get a call from Kansas City. If you do, would you uh, sort of rush it out? 